Hi everybody, welcome to Monday morning. This week is a really special week for us. This is um, the annual National Simultaneous Storytime Week. So on Wednesday at 11 a.m. we will be releasing a story that is read all over the country at the same time. So 11 o'clock on the 27th of May um, and this week or this year will be Whitney and Brittany Chicken Divas. You can see it up the top there. So um, we'll be doing a few activities based around the story. We'll be reading the story at Wednesday on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. But this week we'll also be covering um, a few different topics as well, which again falls in line with our, our small talk programming as normal. And we've been um, we'll be featuring some activities from, from the Storybox Library, Parenting Research Centre, and the Raising Children Network um, website as well. So today what we're looking at is. Um, I guess supporting the idea, the fantastic idea that you guys do in terms of resourcing play with things you've got at home. So today we'll be doing a few activities on what we can do with plastic bottles. Um, easy to resource, uh, you'll always sort of have them around and yeah, just a few tips and tricks to go over that. We'll also um, have a look over the um, basics of toilet training as well. I know a few families we're asking for some tips and tricks. So I've got a few pointers that I'll have on the slideshow. And um, as always, if you've got any further questions, either get in contact with myself or your maternal child health nurse and your GP. Um, and then, yeah, we'll also have some uh, content on following your child's lead, which will be today's or this week's small talk topic. So following your child's lead has your three main points which is focusing on the activity your child's interested in. So that means that you don't need to come up to a child and go, okay, now we're going to focus on your lead. That's going to be our thing. Let's go and do that. It really is about observing the child in their natural state, what they're doing at the current time, and using that as a cue. So if your child is there driving cars along the mat, well, that's what you use as following your child's lead. They're obviously interested in the cars. So what can you do to join in and let them be the leader of that play. You can do things such as, point two, say and do something about what your child is doing. So if you have your child and they're running cars along the map, you could say, wow, I can see you driving your cars there. Have a look, look how the wheels turn. Or you might say, oh, look, there's one. I can see you're going to line the second one up. So really giving a voice and narrating what you can observe them um, doing. And then your third point is encourage your child to do more. So if you've seen your child driving the car along the mat and you say, wow, look, I can see you wheeling your car along. There, look at the wheels, how they turn. Wow, I can see, look, now you've lined up a second one. Can you line up a third one? Let's see how big we can make the line. Well, they might not be lining them up. It may be that they're just driving them around in circles. And you can say, wow, look at the track that you're making. Can we make it bigger? Can your car go around the table there? So what you're really building on is you're building on something that they're already doing, they're interested in it, and you know that they are because they're doing it. Children in general obviously only engage in things that sort of capture their interest. So if they're doing something, it's about us taking what they're doing and see if we can extend it further. Another one would be, um, you know, colouring. They might be colouring. Oh, wow, look, I can see you drawing that lovely picture there. Look at that, you're drawing with the red pencil. So you're extending on what they're doing by introducing colours and, oh, wow, I wonder what colour you're going to pick next. Oh, look, I can see you reaching for the blue pencil, for example. Really extending on. But following your child's lead is fantastic because you can do it in the here and now. It doesn't matter what your child is doing and it doesn't actually take any, you don't need any special tools to follow your child's lead. It's literally just observing them and then thinking about how you can take that a little bit further. So having those discussions, something that, you know, as families we do a lot anyway, and it's just tweaking it that little bit further to um, to get the most out of, out of your interactions. So on the back, everybody in the packs this week will receive one of these cards, and on the back it'll have either of the two backgrounds. So this first one is about babies, and you can see that the child is sitting in the bath and notices the toy duck in the parents' parent's hand and says, er, er, making baby noises. And in this instance, the mother has responded by saying, you're looking at the duck. So again, making sure that they're saying in something about saying what the child is doing. They've noticed that the child is looking at the duck. The child in response has then reached for the duck 
And the parent says, it's a yellow duck. Do you want the duck? So again, adding those extra words, the colours, naming the object that the child's reaching for, and then going on and saying, splash, splash in the water. So again, building on, we're in the bath with the duck, splash, splash, that's what you do in water. Just extending that, and all mum had to do in that instance was just be there, offer words to what is already happening. And similarly to on the second example, which is for more um, your toddlers, so the child has picked up a stone and given it to dad. And dad says, you gave dad a stone. The child picks up another stone and drops it into the bucket. The parent says, there it goes, in the bucket. So again, adding words to what is already happening, giving words to what the child is doing. Then the parent picks up a stone and says, we're putting stones in the bucket. And the child takes that stone from dad's hand and drops it into the bucket. And dad says, there are lots of stones in the bucket. So again, all that he needed, he was already there, supervising the child, interacting with the child. It's just adding that narration, letting the child lead the play. Dad picked up the stones and what did the child do? Took the stones and put it into the bucket because that, that's what he was doing at that time. That's what the child was focused on. So they're just a couple of, of examples, but following your child's lead is easy to do and generally is received really quite well because you're supporting the child in doing what they already want to do. And, and as we know, they really enjoy leading play. So that, uh, that's sort of this week's um, topic and we'll keep that in mind as we go over the rest of our activities this week. But um, the main activities for today were based around plastic bottle play. So as I was saying earlier, um, we all generally have plastic bottles laying around or if we don't, we know someone that can keep some for us. The other week when we did musical instruments, that was an easy plastic bottle one, which was just our shaker. Nice and easy, um, good one for your toddlers, or babies, anyone really, as long as that lid's on nice and tight. Another one that you would have seen that was something that was sort of all more of a rage for your older children, but can be utilised for your toddlers as well, is your bottle toss. So just filling it up, filling your bottle up with sort of no more than a quarter of water in it. And literally it is just throwing and flipping, throwing and flipping. And it's trying to get it so when you flip it up that it lands on its base on the bottle. If I had a bit more space, I'd show you, um, but I can guarantee that I'm not the best at it. If you know a teenager in your life, ask them about the bottle flip, they'll be able to give you a great example. But again, it's a great one for your hand-eye coordination, the fact that they need to concentrate. And what I would encourage as well is get some chalk, um, draw a circle outside, and see if once you've got the knack of actually flipping it and getting it to land, see if you can flip it into a target. So whether it be um, you know, a paper cutout inside that you're using or throw it onto a blanket, chalk outside, make that boundary and create a bit of a physical challenge to throw it in there and get it to land there. Um, as the children start perfecting that, of course, then you make the target smaller and smaller. Great one for competitions if you've got many um, siblings, get them, or even joining in yourself, something nice and easy. But again, that's literally just a bottle and water, so you can't go wrong with that. The third one in the background here is sensory bottles and this is another fantastic, relatively cost effective one that is really, really good and is often used um, for children that need a bit of help or, you know, downtime or time regulating their emotions. So a lot of the time, um, children that are feeling a little bit overwhelmed, they might need a little bit of time, time and space for themselves. And a sensory bottle can be a great way of adding to that so that while they're having their downtime, they can sit and have a look and a bit of a focus on this fantastic sensory bottle. We'll make um, a few different types today. But uh, so one of the first ones is relatively easy and it uses oil, water, some food dye and some inclusions as well. So bear with me. So roughly that's your, your mix, so about two thirds to water and this space here then, we're going to fill with oil. I'm just grabbing my little craft bucket of tricks. For these, I use um, regular cooking oil, but you can also, if you've got access to glycerine, which is like a clear oil um, and makes it look even better. But for today, and what I normally use, is just some cooking oil. And as you can see, I'm not sure that you can see, the oil will bubble and sit on top because oil and water don't mix. So you can sort of see the difference between the water and the oil there, which is really important for the effect that we're going for on this one. Put the lid on there. 
So with our oil and water, what we'll also add is some food dye and a little bit of glitter. Now glitter is always fantastically messy. And today we're going to add a little bit of gold. If you've got sequins, or buttons, anything like that, they also go in there as well or can go in the other ones that we're making. I've just grabbed the food dye. But yeah, this one is a really fun one to do with water and is relatively cost effective um, if you're having a look in some of your cheaper shops, um, they quite often have glitter and a lot of these resources are relatively cheap if you don't have them on hand. But the most important thing to remember is that you don't need to go out and buy special stuff. These are some ideas but you can absolutely resource play with what you've got at home. So we've got some food dye here and we're going to go yellow to match our gold and a few drops should be fine. Sensory bottles, like the shakers we did the other week, need to be sealed really, really well. Children will try to open them, and you can only imagine what kind of mess you'd have. So we've got in there our glitter, water, and oil. Give it a shake and a bit of food dye. And what you'll find, give it a good, good shake. And what you'll find is you can see the swirling effect as the oil and the water combine. Now, as you shake it, and this probably isn't showing it the best, it will actually re-separate so that you'll have blobs that include the glittery, it's almost like a lava lamp, I suppose, the glittery, gloopy movement as the glittery oil moves back to the top and as it resettles. So this one takes a bit of time to sort of resettle and you'll end up with sort of two distinct layers, your water and your oil. And then as you give it a shake again, it'll swirl up inside. So that can be really quite captivating for children as they're sitting, relaxing, and watching the insides ooze and move. And you could use any colour for that. But as I said, seal it well um, and experiment as well. Put a little bit more water, a little less oil, vice versa. And different colours, you'll see some amazing outcomes in that one, and that's relatively easy to do. Another one um, that's even simpler is just getting your bottle of water, so almost filled to the top. You need enough room that the water will flow through. And then I've just got a container here of little sequins, bits and pieces that have been collected. You could probably add um, glitter to this one as well. And it's just a matter of popping a few in the top. So again, water moves faster than oil. So if you had access to a glycerin oil, that would, um, anything you popped inside, any inclusions would move slower and drift slower than if you had it in water. But again, if you had, you know, a selection of these, it's fun to experiment with both. And so these have the tendency to float on the top, but if you give them a shake, you can see in there how the sequins float through the water. You could also add a bit of glitter to these ones, which would again come up fantastic. Now glitter does have a tendency to sort of float and stick a lot of it is about experimentation. The good thing about this is if you've got toddlers or older children, they'll help you with the experimentation. So you can see the glitter there on top. Sit down with some stuff, some bottles and some water and work through it together. So here we go. That's that one with glitter and the sequins, which I think looks really, really cool. And because there's water missing in the top there, you can see as you tip it, They move and flow. So yeah, these are generally named under um, what they're broadly called is as sensory bottles, but you can absolutely make some fantastic combinations. Jump onto your Pinterest and things like that. But if not, as I said, experiment. Get some water, oil, buttons, beads. I've seen um, colored rubber bands popped in water. 
and that also looks fantastic and it's just about getting that flow what baby wouldn't love to lay there and have a look at that through the sunlight as bits and pieces flow around the older children would absolutely love to get involved in helping making those as well so um but yeah so for relatively cost effective items and these will last as long as they're you know careful with them make sure the lid's on they come up really really well all right the other um, bottle activity I thought, which is probably a little bit more extravagant, a little bit more out there, but if you've got the time and the resources, you can absolutely make, this is a hanging plant planter. So again, we've got a bottle. And we just wanna cut a section off that bottle. Excuse me while I get started with the scissors. You just want to sort of cut it around. This would be a really good weekend activity. And again, probably for your older children. But your lilies might like to help as well. So you want to keep the top cone part and your lid on. And in the background, what they've done is they've actually painted the base. Before I paint mine, now you don't need to paint. You could add stickers. You could add textures. I'm just punching the holes in the sides for the string to go through on either side. So you sort of want to even it up, make sure they're relatively even on both sides. You could have two um, holes, you could have four if you wanted to make it really even. This is something that you'd obviously really want to do yourself, not let the children in charge of this. But you get the other sort of give it a bit of a twist. Hole punches if you've got one, probably a little bit safer. So we've got our cup, we've got our holes, as I was saying, so you could paint it. If you had um, stickers, if you had um, any of your Sharpie permanent textures, they'd also be fantastic for drawing designs on it. I've got a little bit of purple paint here, so I thought I might copy what was in the picture in the background there. And I'll pop, make sure I pop the link up as well so you can follow the post that I used behind now the paint that i'm using isn't quite as uh as solid this is just like a, a children's paint if you had any leftover house paint or um you know paint from projects around the house your other alternative is as well bunnings and your other hardware shops do uh, like sample pots of house paint so that can be a really cheap effective way if you're looking for a particular color or you wanted to make a color scheme Grab a little sample pot and that would be more solid like in the picture. This one will dry a little bit clearer, but that's okay. Again, it's about the fun rather than the, the overall effect sometimes. And you could always layer it. So you, I could put some um, stickers around here or I could put a second layer of color. But for today, I'm happy with just the purple. Just come up really nicely. And then I've just got some string. You could use any kind of, um, you know, ribbon, twine, anything that you've got around at home. It'll be outside, but it would be hanging up um, undercover, so it won't be too bad. So I've just cut a length here, and then it's just a matter of looping it through the holes. The good thing about using the lid is that you can it's an easy drainage, so you can have the lid on, depending on what plant, you might have a succulent in there that doesn't need a lot of water, and that'd be fine. If it was something that needed more fast draining, well then you could unscrew the lid a little bit so that some more of the drain water drains out. You take the whole lid off, I suppose, really depending on what sort of media you had in there, what type of soil. Um, you could probably even punch a hole in the lid at the bottom if you were worried about drainage, but being able to sort of screw it off and release, release it would be just as easy. So I've tied the string on. And then what you would do is wait for that to dry. As you can see, pop your soil in there and then you're ready to plant. So that's a nice little um, project that the children would really love to do. Hang a few of them around the back of your veranda, different colours, different sizes, different styles. Um, and yeah, I think it'd be a really 
quick and easy activity that the children would love to get to see as their plants grow. You could also use the bottom, remove the label, have a section like this, have them paint them and they could actually be sitting as plant pots around the place as well. Maybe if the children have their own little special part in the yard or a cubby, that might be the perfect place to hang any of these creations um, where they can enjoy them every day. All right, and the final uh, part from today, which was based on some parental, I suppose, inquiries about things that we could help support with a bit in playgroup, was toilet training. Now, these are, um, I suppose, basic tips and tricks. Every child is different. I've got four children of my own, and every particular child has been different in the way that they approach um, toilet training. So they're by no means prescriptive or you know the way to do it but they're just a few ideas for you it might be something that you haven't tried before as I said um, you know part of playgroup we are here to support families but we're absolutely not experts you guys are the experts on your children and if you have any queries or you need any further support absolutely speak to your GP speak to your maternal child health nurse or if you've got you know extra other professionals um, speak to your allied health professionals as well they know you and your child individually um, much better than we do at this stage. Um, so yeah, but a few tips and tricks anyway. So this first slide I've titled Toilet Training, Is My Child Ready? So some of the signs that you may see which can indicate that they are ready or coming close to being ready for toilet training can be things such as um, your child starting to undress themselves. So your child being able to undress themselves is a really important part of toilet training. Even if they're physically ready, their body's ready, if they're tangled up, um, you know, in overalls or in pants that they can't undo, the likelihood that they're going to have an accident is high because they can't meet their needs because they can't get their pants up and down, for example. So as frustrating as it can be, as your toddler gets a little bit older, it's actually a really great sign to see them starting to remove their pants, um, trying to remove their nappies. They've got the skills in their hands, the muscles, um, to be able to complete that task. Another key indicator is if your child has dry nappies for up to two hours, so at least sort of that two hour window, that's an indication that they're able to hold on to their bodily fluids and can be another indicator that they might be getting ready to toilet train. If your child is telling you, poo, wee, they're actually telling you when they're doing it or after they're doing it, another great indicator. They're starting to recognize what's happening with their body. Um, another Key indicator could be that your child is interested with you on the toilet, is following you to the toilet, is watching, is really quite interested. This is probably something that, um, you know, in family households, it's probably been going on for a long time. Children will often follow mum or dad into the toilet to have a look. Um, but yeah, it's all part of learning. So consider it that. And again, like when we were talking about tuning into your child, following their interests. If your child is interested in watching you on the toilet, giving them the steps. Okay, I've been to the toilet. Now I'm going to grab the toilet paper, two squares and, and wipe myself. Then we put it in the toilet. Then we flush the button. It doesn't need to be overly descriptive, but giving words to the steps that you're going through that they'll be able to then take and build on as they learn. Um, and this was just a tip in general that toilet training often begins during the day. So it is all right if you're toilet training your child during the day and they're in underwear, but they go back into nappy or a pull up for night time. You don't need to hit it all, you know, at once. You can be quite comfortable at toilet training during the day and then still be wearing a night nappy for quite some time. That's normal and that's okay. Break it down into manageable steps. There's no point making a big deal out of it if you then can't manage because it's such um, such a big task. And it is, the reality is accidents will happen. Um, you're learning, they're learning. So yeah, it's totally fine to break it down into day and night. Once we've got day under control, then you might look at day nap. Do we need a nappy for day nap? We might better take that away and then building on into your evenings. So these were just another couple of tips, as I was saying earlier, dress your children in clothes that are easy to take off. And this is often why you'll hear the advice about um, toilet training in summer, because they're either in shorts or skirts, lighter um, clothing that's easier to remove. Um, but yeah, even that, even if, it, you know, sometimes you won't wait for summer, it depends on, you know, your child's readiness and, and your availability, 
but even you know track pants over jeans things with less buttons and zippers and buckles they're going to be things that are going to help your child be more successful in toilet training watching your child for signals if they're jiggling around wriggling they might be holding themselves or pulling at their nappies asking them do you need to go to the toilet or look we haven't been to the toilet for a while let's go together so trying to encourage it and helping them to recognize the cues of their body as well um, and this final tip said that uh, sit your child on the toilet when um, it's likely they're going to need to go so one of our human bodily functions is that we eat and then we obviously need to expel it as well so this example from the Raising Children Network was saying about half an hour after meals is a prime time to sit your child um, on the toilet and quite often has positive results. It also advises that about three to five minutes is long enough for your child to sit. So if you've sat your child and, and they don't look interested or you know they don't look like anything's going to happen, three minutes is okay. I suppose in my experience, I've found if my child's happy to sit there for five minutes, we might have a little bit of a chat we might read a story on the toilet if I'm trying to promote feeling comfortable on the toilet. So that might take 10 minutes. We'll sit, read the story. But again, don't apply pressure. There's no point. A child's not going to respond if you are holding them on the toilet saying, you need to do a wee now. And unfortunately, they're then more worried about other things and, and the body just won't respond in that way. So it doesn't need to be a long time on the toilet. It's about making it positive and making it frequent as well. So if you know we've been to the toilet and nothing's happened this time, Perhaps look at maybe be 15 minutes, 20 minutes the next time before you go again, you know, or if it's going to be another 30 minutes, just staying right on top of that. So there is, it takes time and it takes commitment from both, you know, your child and yourself as a parent to get that, to get that happening. So this slide was toilet training, some tips on how to toilet train. So you've had a look over and you think, yep, you know what, we're going to give it a go. Again, um, you might give it a try for a few days and you might not just be there. You might just be off or it's not working for you. That's okay. You're better off to stop and revisit it again in a couple of months when you're more ready than making it a stressful thing for you. So I guess take a deep breath. It is. It's a big thing as a parent and it's exciting, but it's okay. It's okay to make tiny steps out of it too. Um, I never had a child that was one of those wonderful ones that toilet trained in the space of three days. It was something that we worked at progressively over a period of months, um, you know, gradually improving. But yeah, it's definitely something that, that for me was never a quick fix. Um, but yeah, it's a learning, it's a learning stage, it's a developmental stage, and it's you know something that you just need to take a deep breath, and it is going to be all right in the end. So some tips on how to toilet train. Um, as I was saying earlier, think of toilet training as a series of small goals. So instead of looking at it as toilet training is, you know, okay, we're going to take nappies off today, we're going to go into undies and we're never going to go back and we're going to work towards it and it'll be done in a few days. There are children that operate like that and that is awesome. For others, including my own children, it was definitely a series of steps and, and small wins. So... Um, in those examples, it was uh, start by getting a child familiar with the toilet, what's it, what it's for and how to use it. So just looking and watching and making sure that your child has seen you flush the toilet and has looked in. Some children find the toilet quite daunting. It is noisy, a big splashy noisy thing. It's quite large to sit on. So we often recommend getting a step or a set of ladder, you know, a little step ladder that they can climb up on, making them comfortable. Again, your child's not gonna use the toilet if they're scared of it. So breaking it down to having them approach the toilet, watching you flush, showing them this is the button that we flush, this is how we sit on it, we put the seat down, all those little steps, getting them familiar and feeling comfortable. Um, and yeah, keep in mind that going to the toilet is a complex task. So break it down into small tasks and teach them step by step. So there's the actual getting onto the toilet part, there's the sitting on the toilet part, there's the hopping off, pulling your pants up, flushing, moving your step over to wash your hands, how to wash your hands, all those little things, they're all individual skills that need to come together to make toilet training successful. So even if your child's not ready or you're not quite ready yet to go through the whole toilet training thing, focus on your smaller steps. Having the child helping you at dressing time, pulling up their pants and pulling them down again to put their pajamas on at night. Um, practice hand washing. So have them get their step, bring it up. Show them how to turn on your taps or, or however your system is with your hand soap so that when it comes time to actually toilet train, they already know how to pull their pants down. 
They can already wash their hands. They're comfortable with knowing that the lid goes down before you flush. All those in, in between steps. So the toilet training part is really the only new skill set. Um, so this was consider skipping the potty stage if your child has difficulty with change. Potties versus toilets is, um, is a very individual decision. Some families swear by having a potty and using a potty first because they can have it in the room that they're in and then therefore when they're first starting off and the, sometimes the realisation between I need to go to the toilet and I'm going to the toilet is quite small because they're still learning how to read their body signs. So having the, the potty nearby means that you can sit them on there and you've got more chance of catching it while they're still learning their body cues. Others feel that um, by doing that, then you're learning to transition from nappy to potty, then you're having to again train from potty to how to use the toilet. So some families prefer to go straight into using a toilet. Um, that's a very individual thing and it's worth considering either way. There's pros and cons for both. Um, as your child learns each step of using the toilet, um, encourage with rewards or just in general, anything and any time that your child does something fantastic, have a bit of a cheer. Yay, well done, clap your hands. My 18 month old child now um, takes things to the bin and when he does, he'll open it up, put it in, shut the door and then clap his hands to himself if I'm not quick enough to praise him because he knows generally when I'm trying to you know, show him how well he's doing a great job and I want to encourage those behaviours, yeah, great job, and he's fantastic. So he often goes around and applauds himself for random things. Um, so rewards doesn't necessarily have to be something. It doesn't have to be a toy. It doesn't have to be a sticker. Um, it is enough that it is some praise. Well done, that was fantastic. Look how well you did that. You did that all by yourself. That's something that, again, builds up those good emotions. They feel good. They feel fantastic. They love seeing you happy and they're likely to do it again if they've seen a great response from you. Um, one of the other things that I will provide links for is a using a visual schedule. So these are really handy in that they have um, pictures and it will be pants down, show a picture of the toilet, then it'll show a picture of flushing, washing hands. So it gives those visual cues to children that what comes next. Again, as I said, toileting is a, a daunting thing in that there's many, many steps to it. If you've got something stuck up on the wall where that can jog their memory as they're going through the steps, they're more likely to follow it. And again, if you're having that bit of resistance where they're not keen today or they don't want to go through, you can say, look, look at the chart. It says, you know, flush. And then the next step is to wash our hands. So we've got, what's the next step? Washing our hands. We need to do that. So instead of it becoming that bit of a battle about you want them to wash their hands and they're not interested, going, well, look, this is what the chart says. So taking away that, that battle, I suppose, between parent and child. It's actually the chart that shows us what we do next and then what comes after that. So tuning in, it's a, one of those skills that, you know, if you're tuning in following the lead of your child and they're interested, that's fantastic. If they're not, um, using a visual schedule can be a really great handy little tool to try and help keep your child on track. And the final tip was about going over that story. So even further, you might be able to um, take some photos at home of your own toilet and your own sink. Make a little storybook out of it. If your child's happy to be a part of it, to say, can you wash your hands? I'm gonna take a photo, we're gonna make a story. Go through it, you know, at bedtime or quiet time, sit down and do your, you know, this is our story of how we go to the toilet. First, we take our pants down, have them draw pictures, have them help you out or use the generic um, pictures and make these little books. Have them help you, but go through them. Again, it's about learning the steps for them so that once they're comfortable with that, it's just about, you know, actually getting in and having a go. Um, again, these tips won't work for everybody, but there's some little things that I've sort of found useful over the years in my experience as a parent and as an educator. Um, but yeah, every child is absolutely different. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of sort of getting in and having a go when you think you're ready. A few of the other um, government resources that can be quite handy in general, but do have some great information on toilet training was uh, betterhealth.vic.gov.au raisingchildren.net.au, which is what I used a lot of the, um, the pictures from today. They were fantastic. And they have a lot of printables as well, which is handy. 
And I've also found some handy information on startingblocks.gov.au, which is governed by a CEQA, who is one of our accreditation bodies for our long daycare organisations. There's absolutely more resources out there. There's plenty. Um, but these were three that were, um, you know, governed by our government here in Australia and I thought were absolutely worth a mention. Um, now, tomorrow, so that sort of sums up for today. Tomorrow we'll be getting into some art and craft, getting ready for our fantastic National Simultaneous Story Time story of Whitney and Brittany Chicken Divas. So there'll be a little bit of art and craft based around chickens. As you can see, one of the things we're going to be doing tomorrow is making egg carton chicken masks. So egg cartons are another um, readily available resource if you eat eggs at home, of course. And if not, there's usually someone in your family that likes to stockpile them. So we'll be starting off tomorrow morning with an egg carton chicken mask and we will absolutely go from there. So thank you so much for joining me today and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you.